Hello, welcome back to 40 Days with the Fathers. We're on day 40, the last one of the series, finishing off with a sermon from Leo the Great on the resurrection. So this sermon is on the gospel, incarnation and resurrection of the Lord, to encourage the church in the power of the incarnation and the true faith and nature of Christ, and how the, all of this gives us a new meaning for Passover. So here we are, the final day in the series. I hope you found it an interesting journey through church history, covering various authors and topics from the first four centuries of the church. What a better way to end this series than on the resurrection itself. The whole of the Easter mystery, dearly beloved, has been brought before us in the gospel narrative, Leo declares as the opening statement of this sermon. What is this Easter mystery? The cross of Christ, which was set up for the salvation of mortals, which is both a mystery and an example for us to follow. It's a sacrament whereby the divine power takes effect and an example whereby man's devotion is excited to be inseparably united to Christ. He who is the way that is of holy living, the truth of divine doctrine and the life of eternal happiness. Christ took our nature upon him for our salvation. In the beginning, when the whole body of mankind had fallen, our merciful God had purposed in himself to make a way to reconcile his creatures made after his image through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Leo goes on to say that if we had not fallen from, had not fallen from how God had made us, we'd have been happy. But now we can be happier if we remain in what he has remade us to be through the spirit. Jesus was excluded from all taints of the sin which was passed upon all men, that taint being weakness and mortality, which were not sin, but the penalty of sin. The Redeemer of the world suffered these things for our sake, that they might be reckoned as the price of redemption. In us is the heritage of condemnation, but in Christ the mystery of godliness. Through the enemy, Jesus had his spotless flesh tortured, and because of this, Jesus willingly went to die for us. Now believers in him might find neither persecution intolerable nor death terrible by the remembrance that there was no more doubt about their sharing his glory than there was about his sharing their nature. Set your minds on things that are above. Following on with the previous thought, Leo goes on to explain that in Christ we are crucified, we are dead, we are buried, and on the very third day too, we are also raised. Which is why Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 3 verses 1 to 4. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We achieve this raising by the power of Christ with us, who lifts us up because he is with us as he promised. I am with you always to the end of the age, he said in Matthew 28. This in itself fulfills the promise that his own name means God with us, as prophesied by Isaiah. But even in Christ's ascending, he had not forsaken us because even though he sits at the right hand of God, he also dwells within the whole body of believers. Christ's victory is assuredly ours, just as we should expect since Jesus has conquered this world. Whatever we battle against in this world, whether lust, greed or heresy, let us arm ourselves always with the Lord's cross, so that our paschal feast will never end by staining from the leaven of wickedness and having the mind of Christ. The nature of the incarnation. But only those who hold the correct view of the Incarnation can properly appreciate Easter and the Lord's Passover, Leo says. In explaining this thought, he gives a sort of creedal statement similar to the Nicene Creed to demonstrate his beliefs on the matter. And to quote him, he says, For the Lord, no, for the Son of God is true God, having from the Father all that is the, fa the Father is, with no beginning in time, subject to no sort of change, undivided from one God, not different from the Almighty, the eternal, only begotten of the Father, so that the faithful intellect 
believing in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in the same essence of the one Godhead, neither divides the unity by suggesting degrees of di dignity, but confound confounds the Trinity by merging the persons in one. So when Jesus emptied himself for our sake and our restoration, it was not for the loss of power, but, but for compassion, for there is no other name under heaven by which we are saved. In expounding on Philipp Philippians 2, Leo draws some nice contrasts which highlight just what Jesus did when he stepped down from heaven. To quote him, he says, The invisible made his substance visible, the intemporal temporal, the impassable passable, not that power might sink into weakness, but that weakness might pass into indestructible power. So again, that thought of our humanity is raised up into power and glory and godliness in that theosis sense, not that by him being incarnate as a human, his power was diminished. He made us, our humanity, or made a way for our humanity to become like the divine. So a new meaning for Passover. Quoting John 13, 1, Leo in reinterprets Passover as now meaning that it was about the time when Jesus should pass out of this world and unto the Father. In terms of Jesus' nature during that time, he goes on to say that because the word and the flesh is one person, the assumed is not separate from the assuming nature, meaning that also humanity is now forever a part of the Godhead, and therefore it promotes our nature as one which will one day be glorified in the resurrection. I'll just go back over that bit because sometimes people don't necessarily grasp this so much that Jesus has assumed our nature and brought it up into the heavenly into the Godhead. He took that body up as he ascended and now he is forever a glorified man. He has brought humanity and the Godhead together so that it makes a way for us to become in the resurrection glorified in that same sense. Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven and it is from there that we are expecting a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it might be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. To share in this unspeakable gift, the Lord, ahead of his passion, prepared a blessing, passing over for his faithful ones, and for the whole church who were yet to come, by his prayer in John 17, verses 20 to 21, which asked for total unity with one another, and also with God, in the same way that he and the Father were one. Only true believers can keep the Easter feast festival. Those who deny the true nature of the Son of God, and that he is also true God, can have no part in his divine union, nor in the Easter festival. True Christians, accepting the creed and deity of Christ, rightly exult the devoutly, and devoutly rejoice in the sacred season of Lent and Easter, or Pascha. They have no doubt about Christ's birth according to the flesh, his passion and death, and the resurrection of his body, who was truly born of a virgin's womb, truly hung on the wood of the cross, truly laid in an earthly tomb, truly raised in glory, truly set on the right hand of the Father's majesty. This again is another example of a creedal statement about Jesus, much like we saw in the earlier texts from the first couple of centuries, which sought to deal with docetism. It really just hammers home the point of Christ's reality in life, something we should never forget. That marks the end of this reading plan, and uh, or video plan in this case. I hope you've enjoyed it throughout these 40 days and learned something new. And I pray and hope that you've had your health built up and or restored through reading about the various topics, issues and doctrinal theological statements that the early church went through to preserve the faith despite all the persecution and killing along the way. So, uh, but if nothing else, always remember that Jesus is risen and alive. So that's the end of this series, the end of this book. In the book, there's some extra bits at the back. I've got, there's maps and things so you can see where the texts were written. Um, 
also Ignatius's journey to his martyrdom is there. And there's also a timeline I've put together of when texts were written alongside other major historical events. So you can sort of get a more wider context of when the New Testament happened, certain events in history that would have affected things like Nero's persecution, etc. And when the other church started writing texts in response to these things as well. And also a list of well-known historically condemned heresies. So just to give you a sort of quick A to Z of the major ones and when they were condemned and what they were about. So all in all, the whole book is a nice resource for you if you like church history um, or interested in getting into it. So it acts as a, I hope you've seen as a sort of bridge introduction for the topic if you've never dealt, delved into it before. I thought it was too much of a heavy academic one. Um, so yeah, links are below if you want to buy it or the companion book, the translation, or just like and share the video. And uh, yeah, leave a comment if you've enjoyed this. S subscribe to the channel because I'll be adding new videos related to other topics in the future. So see you soon. Thanks for watching.